and everything is done, and they're back there, like, waiting. Uh-huh. They're waiting on you to say, please rise for our doxology, and then okay. that's when you're going to come back. Okay, and they'll perfect. walk down, yep. and I'll grab the plate. Yep. Okay. And, and we just replay just uh, just, just that one just line. Okay. And then, and then replay it through, like, the full session, session like, one time. Uh, yeah, however long it takes for them to walk down, get the plate, put them down.
Sometimes on this journey, sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. But looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. on the move when the father's in the room. The prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. The love is on the move when the father's in the room. Miracles take place, a cynical find. I'd like to turn, well, good morning. Let me say that first. Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's this morning. We are so happy to have y'all here with us for this service. 
Um, I'd like to turn your attention to a couple of announcements we have in our bulletins. So on Tuesday, June 28th at 1130, we are going to have a UMW summer salad luncheon and all the women are welcome. So all you have to do is bring a salad or a dessert to share and of course yourself. So I encourage everyone to come to that. It's gonna be in the parlor. And then on Sunday, June 3rd, we will have one service at 10 o'clock and the church office will be closed on the 4th and the 5th. Please take a look at all the other things we have going on today and for the rest of this week and the month. As some of y'all know, we had annual conference um, two weeks ago now. Me and RB and Stuart Shelby went to Baton Rouge and I was asked to talk about uh, what we learned and heard there. So the theme for this year's annual conference was to inspire. No matter the church, a growing church or a tired church, we know that God's love is still being poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. We focused on two scriptures in Romans, Romans 5, 5 through 11, and 12, 9 through 11. And I'd like to read those to you. Chapter 5 says, This hope will not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the appointed moment, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person. Though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by his blood, we will be saved through him from wrath. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus. We have now received this reconciliation through him. And then chapter 12, love must be without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack diligence. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. So as this was my first time going to an annual conference, it was interesting to see how the church works together to create the United Methodist Church. I got to see a lot of people that I hadn't seen in a while, and for some reason I didn't think they would be there. Like Chad Brooks and Lori Spangler, who are pastors in the United Methodist Church, they'd probably be at an annual conference, but I was surprised for some reason. It was also a somewhat sad first conference because we had a total of 14 churches leave the United Methodist. Five of them closed and nine of them disaffiliated, which is not normal, and next year there will probably be more. But they wanted to inspire us to have God's mission as our own. Mission is an attribute of God, and the church is an instrument of God's mission. We have to reclaim that power and our mission and become a voice of equality and justice. Our world is suffering, which means our neighbors are suffering. We have to be more deliberate with being a neighbor. We have to put our differences aside and stop competing with each other. We all have the same goal, and it's not a race to the finish line. While I did not understand half of what was being said with all the petitions and accounting words, I could feel God's presence. I know it is easy to find something to be angry about, but I know that we all have the common goal to bring people to Christ. And since I know we have that common goal, I know that this church is a strong community and I know we will always flourish. That's what I learned at annual conference. And now I'd like to turn your attention to the back of our bulletin for our birthdays and anniversaries this week. If you know any of them or see any of them, give them a congratulations on their anniversary and a happy birthday, and I'm sure they will appreciate it. If you'll also please keep the members in the prayer list in your prayers as we go throughout this week, 
And I'd like to highlight the George Snellings family and Erica Ryan's family. <coughs> and you'll also notice we have some beautiful flowers in the narthex. And those are placed in memory of Katie Joyce by her mother, father, and Lily. And those are placed for her birthday. So happy birthday, Katie. So please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for letting us gather here today. Thank you for all the blessings you have given us. We thank you for our family and the memories that we have together. Thank you for our church community where we are able to learn about you freely and dive deeper into your word. We thank you that we have a home to shelter us from this heat and that we have safe drinking water and food at our disposal. We thank you for all of this and so much more. We admit that we can take these blessings for granted and we can forget about those who live with nothing more than the shirt on their back. But Jesus shows us to not pass these people by when he says, if you feed the hungry and give water to the thirsty, if you do this to the least of these, of our brothers and sisters, we do it for him. Help us to remember that we as Christians are supposed to be the positive in people's lives. We are supposed to be the movement. Take away our sinful nature, our pride and selfless selfishness, so that your grace and love can shine through. We know that your spirit is here with us, so we invite you into our hearts and our minds to take away our darkness, so there is only your holy light. Help us to be a people of action, not hollow words of faith. We pray for our divided country to come together and to make the right decision. We pray for our first responders and active military to have your protection. We pray for those who are sick and hurting to have your peace and experience your healing on their wounded bodies and spirits. We pray for those on our prayer list and those in our hearts and minds. We pray that all of these people know they are loved by you, and it is our prayer that everything we do is for your glory. In the name of the Lord our God, with the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now please stand and sing with me for our praise song set.
Father's house, in my Father's house, there's a peace for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am. Amen. in his name worthy Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we Beside you, open up my eyes. 
good morning. I know I'm not Miss Jill, but I'm going to do my best. So I need two volunteers to help me show what we will be learning about today. As a volunteer, one and two, do you want to? Okay. So you are so brave, brave, I don't know why I said it like that, that you will help even though you don't know what I'm asking you to do. What if it was something like really difficult? Hey, JP. That's okay. What if it was something really difficult, like moving a heavy couch? Or what if it was something really scary, like walking on a tightrope? Don't worry, I'm not going to make you do either of those things. I promise you it's not scary and it's not difficult. All I need your help doing is playing a game of follow the leader. But it has a twist to it. I need my two volunteers to wear blindfolds. Ooh. Arby. All right, so who do you think has the more difficult job, the leader or the followers? Yes, the leader. <laughs> the leader has to decide what to do and guide the followers and keep them safe. The followers have to trust their leader and they don't get to decide what they do. As a leader, we don't want our followers to bump into anything or get hurt, but thankfully, I have this rope that we can all hold on to. And with this, I can guide the followers by gently pulling them behind me. As long as everyone holds onto the rope, they will be able to follow the leader. Okay, so can y'all both stand up? There. Hold on, hold on. All right, we ready? All right, we're gonna go. This way. Here we go. Oh. Go down the step. Step. Oh, step. Step. Oh, y'all are doing a, so, a good job. Aren't they doing such a great job, everybody? <laughs> Round of applause. Y'all are doing so good. Okay, let's come back up. Step. Step. Good job. We made it back. Round of applause again for our amazing volunteers. You can take the blindfolds off now. Thank y'all. You know what this kind of reminds me of? Jesus and his followers. So in the Bible, it talks about a time when Jesus was walking along the road with some of his disciples. And one of them said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. How many of you would have said that? You would have to Jesus? I probably would have said him to Jesus. When Jesus' friends told him they'd follow him wherever he went, he said something kind of strange. He said, foxes have holes to live in and birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay his head. What do you think that means? It means he doesn't have a home. That's a good guess. That sounds like a weird response, right? Jesus meant that even though following him is the best thing we could ever do, that doesn't mean it'll always be easy. Like our volunteers, we don't know all the things he will ask us to do. But if we hold tight on to him, we can trust he will guide us through anything difficult that we face. There's this song, it's called Hold On to Jesus by Aaron O'Donnell. Have you ever heard of it? No? We're going to repeat some of the lines, okay? So repeat after me. I wish I could protect you from the worries of this life. But if there's one thing I could tell you, it's no matter what you do, hold to Jesus. He's holding on to you. Good job. 
We have to hold on to Jesus with white knuckles. That means you're holding on super tight that you can see the white poking through on your knuckles. Because he's holding on to you just as tightly. Okay, can you show me your prayer hands? Please bow your heads with me. Dear God, we thank you for sending your son to save us and to be our guide through life. Remind us to always hold on to Jesus through our storms and our sunny days. In your name we pray and all the children say, Amen. bulletin there is a tear off um, for our communication card if you would please fill that out and tear it off put it in the plate as they come by there are many different ways you can give for st paul's you can give on the plates through snail mail or through a direct deposit thing that kathy wells knows about um, i'd also like to remind you that we are still doing uh, rays of sunshine so every dollar you place in the plate it's going to be an extra dollar that makes a difference. So, please pray with me. Dear God, there are always highs and lows in this life, but you are a constant. You are always there, never ending and never changing. Though this world may fail us, you will never fail. You ask us to trust you, that you will provide for us. So as we give our offerings today, help us to give back to you fully with not only our money, but also our lives, because we trust that you will provide. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy Lowe. Thank you, Jeremy Lowe and the praise band. Appreciate you all this morning leading us in worship. Thank you, Elise. Double time working as our liturgist and our children's director while Jill is down in Florida on a retreat. Thank you in the back. Appreciate you all very much. Michael and is it Vance back there? Good, good. Good to see you all. Excellent. I'm still sounding like I'm echoing, but Hey, that's better than at 9 o'clock. We did not have any speakers working in the sanctuary at 9 o'clock. It's interesting that if you'd been in Fellowship Hall or the nursery or the narthex or the parlor, you could have heard us, but not here in the sanctuary. 
It was kind of crazy. And so while we were working on it, in between services, we would talk in the pulpit, and eventually those in the parlor came and told us, we can hear you singing or laughing or talking or whatever we were doing. So we were creating a disturbance everywhere except in here. So finally we got it going, and I'm grateful for those who did the work. Kirby, for example, was one of them. Thank you, Kirby. Also, let me add to what Elise was saying earlier. We've had two funerals this past week, of course, for the George Snellings family. Let's continue to be in prayer for them. Also, you know, many of you, Mike and Michael and Erica Ryan. Erica Ryan's father passed away, Jay Moser. We had his funeral Friday, graveside over at the Veteran Cemetery in Rabel. So keep Erica Ryan and her family in your prayers as well. This morning we're looking at the power of, excuse me, the Tower of Babel. Maybe it's the power of Babel, but anyway, the Tower of Babel, Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible to them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. And they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Here are a few factoids for you. Did you know the Empire State Building in New York City reaches a height of 1,250 feet? It contains 102 floors. Uh, theoretically, four football fields at 100 yards each fit snugly into the Empire State Building. Yet there are 53 taller buildings in the world which reach toward the sky. For your information, the tallest skyscraper in the world stands in the city of Dubai. The Burj Khalifa ascends 2,717 feet and holds 160 floors of space. Yet nine football fields at 100 yards each squeeze into the Burj Khalifa. It's a giant among giants when it comes to skyscrapers. This leads me to discuss what we often call the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. Right off the bat, we see the people who lived in the land of Shinar had big plans. We read about their big plans in Genesis chapter 11. They said to one another, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower and let us make a name for ourselves. They have big plans. Also note the fact that in their communication, they only address one another. Nowhere do we see the people living in Shinar consulting the God of creation about their plans. In today's world, many Americans have that same attitude. They behave the same way. Like those who lived on the plain of Shinar, sometimes we get wrapped up in our plans and we leave God out of the process. Once a lady was cooking a chocolate pie and she was totally absorbed in her afternoon television show. In fact, as she was trying to follow her recipe, she really didn't follow her recipe. That evening after supper, it was time to serve the chocolate pie that she had worked on so diligently that afternoon. And little Johnny and the family was the first one to take a bite. And he re replied with, gag, mom, this tastes like mud. And she went back and she looked and she realized she'd left the sugar out of the recipe for her chocolate pie. In a similar way, there are times in life when we get caught up in our own plans and we leave God out of the recipe. By way of illustration, some people stay out late most Saturday nights and sleep late on Sunday mornings. 
Could it be at least some of these people? Could it be? Could it be? Just asking gently. Could it be that some of these people who miss church on Sunday mornings because of their Saturday night behavior, could it be that they've left God out of the recipe? Also, you know, there are all kinds of sports for us to enjoy. I enjoy hunting and fishing and water skiing and baseball and football and softball and basketball and golf, just to name some of my favorites. Yet some people allow these recreational pursuits to dominate their time commitments. Sometimes in our overcommitment to a sport, God gets kicked to the curb. Still, I like what a minister friend says on the subject of sports. Reverend John McClellan says, if you miss a Sunday because of baseball, be sure to come the next Sunday and double tithe. I'm all for that. Still, many individuals make big plans for the weekends. They make big plans for the summer or big plans for the future. Yet they fail to consult God in the planning stages. Here's the harsh reality. Brace yourself. Let me just say this gently. Many of Americans reflect the same godless attitude as those who lived on the plain of Shinar. Many Americans talk about their big plans for tomorrow, but they fail to listen for God's divine guidance today. We also see this passage point to the maxim that says, there are times to scatter and there are times to gather. When it comes to scattering, God gives a command to humanity in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Early in salvation history, we see God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. God tells people to fill the earth. It's God's way of saying, get on the move, scatter, go on an adventure, discover the universe I have created for you to enjoy. There are times to scatter. But the people living in the land of Shinar felt they had a better idea. They disobeyed God's ideal for humanity when the earth was ripe for the picking. We read the first and the last phrases in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad the face of the whole earth. The people of Shinar wanted to gather during a time which was ideal for scattering abroad. There are, are, there are ideal times scattered. Still, there's also a time to gather. Listen to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. After the resurrection of Christ, the believers in Christ gathered in Jerusalem. I've said it before, I'll say it again. There's strength in numbers. Perhaps better, we place ourselves in a position to receive spiritual strength as we gather with other believers. Plus, let me add, sometimes when believers gather, God shows up in a miraculous way. We see a miracle of God in Acts chapter 2, verse 6. The sound of a tornado filled the house. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Did you know that in Jerusalem after the resurrection on the day of Pentecost, we have a reversal of Babel. On the plains of Shinar, in Genesis chapter 11, the story ends with confusion. Communication breaks down. Yet at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, we see a reversal of what took place at the Tower of Babel. The language barriers tumble down in Acts chapter 2. Walls of separation crumble on the day of Pentecost as people understand the disciples speaking their own languages. Often we hear people claim the day of Pentecost was an event where miraculous speech in other languages took place, and that's true. But Pentecost was also a miracle of hearing, a miracle of listening, a miracle of understanding. Point being, there's also a time to gather. For as I say, when we gather, we may gain spiritual strength from one another. Yet we may also gain spiritual understanding from each other as well. I say all this to once more emphasize the truth that the Bible emphasizes. As we scatter, we are to discover and enjoy God's creation. Yet the word of God also proclaims. 
as we gather for worship and fellowship. Let us speak one another's languages and listen with understanding hearts. Once more in Genesis chapter 11, here's something that may not make sense at first, but listen carefully. When we believe in the stars of the sky, it's reminiscent of worshiping on the Tower of Babel. Listen to Genesis chapter 11, verse 4. Then they said, come let us build a tower with a top in the heavens. Yet, you see, actually, the Tower of Babel was not intended to be a skyscraper. It was intended to be a place to worship the stars in the sky. The verse of scripture we are considering may also be paraphrased to say, let us build a tower whose top is the heavens. You see, the tower in question more than likely was a ziggurat. Ziggurats look sort of like a pyramid. Archaeologists, archaeologists have uncovered a number of ziggurats. For example, in the ruins of ancient Babylon, a ziggurat was unearthed. It stood about 153 feet high and was about 400 feet wide at its base. It was constructed with seven stages or levels or terraces corresponding to the seven known planets at the time. The seven levels ascending to the top stood for the planetary gods. Once a worshiper reached the top of the ziggurat, on the summit there stood a tower. On the top of the tower were the signs of the zodiac. I say all this to make a point. The Tower of Babel was constructed so the people living on the plain of Shinar might worship the stars in the heaven above. It was a place where astrology was practiced as a religion. Again, I say, when we believe in the stars in the sky, it's reminiscent of worshiping on top of the Tower of Babel. We have two applications at this point. First, worshiping the stars obviously speaks of astrology. For entertainment purposes, many Americans read their horoscopes at least once a week. Yet there are a number of people throughout history who gave astrology much weight. But astrology misses the point. We are not called to seek guidance from the stars and planets spun into space by the God of the universe. We are called instead to seek divine guidance from the creator of the universe. The one who created the constellations in the sky possesses more power and wisdom than the signs of the zodiac, such as Pisces or Leo or Virgo or Sagittarius. There's a second application some people also worship. Some people also worship Hollywood stars or sports stars or television stars or rock stars or, or stars in some other form of entertainment. But if we make the mistake of spiritually, spiritually dancing with the stars with our devout worship, we will eventually be disappointed. Take, for instance, Elvis Presley and Michael Jackson. There are millions who still adore them. I dare say more than a few are still on the edge of worshiping them. Even so, star power disappoints us in the end. Now, I'm not here to criticize the king of rock or the king of pop, but I am here to say only the king of kings deserves our worship. When we worship famous stars, we are not too far removed from those who ascended a ziggurat on the plain of Shinar to worship the stars above. On top of this, the narrative we call the Tower of Babel partially answers the question, what happens when people rebel against God? We see the intervention of God in Genesis chapter 11, verses 7 and 8. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. When we rebel against God, we no longer listen to the voice of reason. We no longer understand others. The word in verse 7 for understand is the Hebrew word shema, meaning hear. We no longer hear others. We no longer listen to others. Instead, rebellion leads to confusion. Let me look at this unfortunate truth from a humorous angle. Colleen Moore was a famous actress during the silent film era about a hundred years ago. Anybody remember Colleen Moore? She made the Dutch boy, the bobbed hair cut, famous. 
On one occasion when she was visiting Europe, the mayor of Zurich, Switzerland, hosted a dinner in her honor, and he asked the orchestra to play the national anthem for the United States of America, and the orchestra played instead, My Country, Tis of Thee. And she then explained to the mayor that that tune actually was the British national anthem tune for God Save the Queen. And the orchestra then played the Stars and Stripes Forever, which is what American troops march to when they're in parade. And she explained again to the mayor, that's not quite the national anthem. So finally, the German orchestra conductor called Colleen Moore to his side and he said, what's the name of your national anthem? And she answered, the Star Spangled Banner. And the orchestra then played, yes, we have no bananas. And after it was over, she simply smiled and said, that was lovely. And that's just a humorous look at a breakdown in communication. Yet on a more serious note, when we actively rebel against the ideals of God, confusion erupts. Understanding grinds to a halt. To look at it another way, necessity may be the mother of invention, but rebellion is the mother of confusion. With this in mind, let's be clear. Let's go in the opposite direction of the people who built the Tower of Babel. As we learn from the book of Genesis, let's scatter to discover the gifts awaiting us in God's creation. And as the believers did in the second chapter of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, let's also gather to worship the one true God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you've called us to scatter and to receive the gifts that you have scattered throughout our own world. And yet you've also called us to gather for fellowship, for spiritual strength, and for worship. Give us the wisdom to know when to scatter and when to gather. And in those times of wisdom, may we follow your spiritual leadership with the spirit of obedience. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Let's now stand and sing our closing song. You have broken every curse Blessed Redeemer You have set this captive free Lord, I can't help but sing
Thank you so much for joining us here this Sunday morning, and thank you to RB for our wonderful message. Please pray with me for our benediction. Dear God, as we leave this place of worship today, let us leave branching out. Let us not be afraid to scatter and explore all you have for us. Let us not focus on the future that we have planned, but watch for you today in this moment and trust you as you lead us into the next. In your name we pray, amen. Go in peace.